In this video, I'll show you how to create your own custom sky, step by step. I'm using Affinity Photo 2.3.1. Here's a sky in need of pizzazz, but rather than replacing it with another one, I'll create my very own. It's late winter, so I'm in the mood for a summer evening sky. Mine will be quasi-realistic, but the very same approach I'll use can be used to create a realistic one. It's up to you. First, I'll create the sky backdrop. This step is optional. You can use the existing sky in your photo as the backdrop, if you like. From the Layer menu, I'll select New Fill Layer. The Gradient tool is automatically selected with the New Fill Layer, so I'll pull the gradient down. I'll reverse it by clicking the Reverse Gradient button on the Context toolbar. Now to create my warm summer evening backdrop. I'll click on the top node to select it and change its color to light blue by clicking on the color panel. Now I'll double click in the middle of the gradient arm to add another node and change its color to light magenta. And I'll select the bottom node and change its color to yellow. I'll zoom out a bit to give myself room to work and adjust the gradient to my liking. OK, I'll press Command-0, Control-0 in Windows to get back to the normal view. I'll rename the Fill Layer to Sky Backdrop by double-clicking on the layer where it says Fill and typing in the new name and pressing the Return key. Next, I need to isolate the backdrop to the sky portion of the photo. To do that, I'll select the sky and then, with the selection active, apply a mask to the Fill Layer. First, I'll turn the Fill Layer off and select the Background Layer. I'll use the Flood Select tool to select the sky. I'll enable Add Mode by clicking this button on the Context toolbar. Now, each time I click the mouse, I'll be adding to the selection instead of starting a new one. I'll click on the sky to select it. I'll click again up here to get everything. To finish up, I'll use the Selection Brush tool. I'll make sure Snap to Edges is checked on the Context toolbar. This makes the job of selecting and deselecting much easier, as the selection will automatically grow out or shrink to the nearest edge, depending on whether you're in Add or Subtract mode. I'll select any unselected areas in the sky. I can use the square bracket keys to adjust the size of the brush. Next, I'll zoom right in on the parent and child to see if anything needs fixing. The area enclosed by the parent's arm is not selected. I'll adjust the size of the brush and click in that area to select it. There's a selected area on the parent's back. I'll switch to Subtract mode by clicking this button on the Context toolbar and deselect any selected areas. I'll scan the horizon for any other problem spots. Everything's good, so I'll zoom back out. I'll turn the fill layer back on and select it. To restrict the fill layer to the sky, I'll apply a mask to it. I'll click the mask icon at the bottom of the layers panel to apply the mask. I'll clear the selection by pressing Command-D or Control-D in Windows. For those who are unfamiliar with masks, I left two links in the description to videos that cover them in detail. I want to adjust the backdrop a bit more, so I'll select the Fill Layer and then select the Gradient tool. Again, I'll zoom out to give myself more room to work. That's more to my liking. I'll get back to the default view. As mentioned, I'm not trying to be too realistic here. Now, let's have a full moon rising just above the horizon. I'll switch tabs to a photo containing a full moon. I'll use the selection brush. I'll increase the size of the brush. 
That's big enough, so I'll just click on the moon and snap the edges. We'll take care of the rest. I'll copy that by pressing Command C, Control C in Windows, or I can select Copy from the Edit menu. I'll switch tabs to our photo and press Command V, Control V in Windows to paste the moon in, or I can select Paste from the Edit menu. I'll select the Move tool and position the moon. Right there looks good. I'll rename the layer to Moon. Obviously the moon should be behind our subject. I'll expand the sky backdrop layer and holding down the command key, control key in Windows, I'll click on the mask layer's thumbnail to reactivate the selection of the sky I made earlier. With the moon layer selected, I'll apply a mask to it. And there we go. I'll clear the selection. The moon's not fitting in, so I'll try changing the moon layer's blend mode. First, I'll make sure the moon layer is selected. Overlay works really well. Let's tweak it a bit more with a curves adjustment. I'll drag it over the moon layer until the entire layer is highlighted and release it. This way, it'll be placed below the mask layer. The curves adjustment is now a child of the moon layer, so its effect will be restricted to the moon only. I'll make some adjustments. All right, that really works. Here's a handy tip. If you want to reposition the moon, select its layer, then select the Move tool, and put a check mark and lock children on the context toolbar. I'll press Command Z, Control Z in Windows to undo that. If you don't check lock children, the mask will move with the moon. Next, I'll add some clouds. I'll switch tabs to a photo with a variety of cumulus clouds. These are easy to select because they're well-defined. White wispy clouds, by contrast, would be difficult at best. I'll grab the selection brush and select the cloud. I'll click Refine on the Context toolbar to refine the edges of the selection. I'll zoom in a bit and use the matte brush to paint around the edges of the cloud to get rid of blue areas and also get a more detailed selection of the wispy edges. I'll switch to the background brush to deselect part of this other cloud. I'll switch back to matte and finish painting around the edges. Okay, from the output drop down at the bottom of the dialog, I'll select New Layer. This will produce a more accurate selection. If I were to leave it at selection, a lot of the wispy detail around the edges would be lost. I'll click Apply. A new layer has been created containing only the cloud I selected. I'll copy it and switch back to our photo and paste it in. I'll use the Move tool to position and resize the cloud. That looks good right about there. I'll rename the layer Cloud. To help it fit in, I'll look for a good blend mode. Lighten may work. 
I'll lower the opacity of the cloud layer as well. Next, I'll try a brightness and contrast adjustment. I'll make it a child of the cloud layer to limit its effect to the cloud. I'll drag it over to cloud layer until only the cloud layer's thumbnail is highlighted and release it. I'll adjust contrast and brightness. Making progress, but I think we can do a little better. I'll add a curves adjustment, and again I'll make it a child of the cloud layer. That's looking better. As a final step, I'll add a color balance adjustment. I'll use it to give the cloud some of its surrounding sky color, helping it blend in. Starting with mid-tones, I'll move the magenta green slider over towards the magenta side. If the surrounding sky were yellow, for example, I would move the yellow-blue slider over to the yellow side instead. I'll select shadows from the tonal range drop-down and do the same. The highlights look okay, so I won't bother with them. All right, that is looking good. There are a few more clouds I want to add, but the process is the same, so I'll go ahead and add them off camera and see you in a couple of seconds. Okay, all the clouds are added. Because this is Lake Ontario, the sky would not be complete without a flock of geese. I'll switch tabs to a photo of just that. To select these, I'll first select the background and then invert the selection, which will result in the geese being selected. I'll grab the Flood Select tool and set it to Add Mode in case I need to click more than once to select the background. I'll click on the white background. I need to click again down here at the bottom. Now from the Select menu, I'll choose Invert Pixel Selection. Let's refine the selection. I'll zoom in to get a better look. Some of the geese are only partially selected. I'll use the foreground brush to select them more fully. I'll leave output at selection this time and click the apply button. I'll copy the geese over to our photo. I'll use the move tool to position and size them. In front of the moon looks good. I'll rename the layer Geese. I'll zoom in to see them better. I'll add a brightness and contrast adjustment and make it a child of the Geese layer. I'll lower the brightness. Let's try a curves adjustment too. I'll pull the mid-tones down so they're slightly silhouetted against the sky. Okay, I'll zoom back out. That looks great. The sky is done. The next step is to match the lighting for sky and foreground. First I'll merge all visible layers into a single layer. 
From the Layer menu, I'll select Merge Visible. A new pixel layer has been created at the top of the layer stack. Now I'll tell Affinity to calculate the average color of that layer and fill it with that color. From the Filters menu, I'll select Blur and then Average. The layer is now a solid mauve color. This is the average color. To apply a uniform lighting to both sky and foreground, I'll simply change its blend mode to soft light. It's subtle, but it made a difference. I'll turn the layer off and on so you can see it better. I'll apply a curves adjustment to the entire photo to help bring everything together that much more. Just pulling down the midtones a bit works great. I think bringing out the blue of the lake would look good, so I'll add an HSL adjustment and make it a child of the background layer. I'll select the cyan channel and move the saturation slider to the right. I'll bring out yellow just a bit as well. I think that is done. I'll do a before and after. Not bad at all. You now have the tools to get started having fun creating your own skies. Thank you for watching.